morning comes again from Matthew the fifth chapter as we continue in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and then you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You've heard it said by those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in her heart, in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right eye hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. May God add his blessing to his holy word. In this sermon, Jesus is speaking to the crowd and he's speaking to them about the will of God. They're used to the Pharisees talking to them about the law and how they should live by it. But Jesus is taking it a step further. They're used to being taught by the Pharisees and the scribes who make it a point to tell him what the letter of the law is just exactly what it is. Jesus is telling them what the heart of the matter is and what God's intent for them is regarding these passages. Jesus said to them, you have heard it said, you shall not murder, but I say to you, but I say to you, Jesus said, who is it but God who can say that? Who is it but God that can give this direction? The people had heard the scribes and the Pharisees as they quoted the laws, and as at times when they twisted them to suit themselves and make themselves look good. But Jesus came to them and spoke to them with the authority of the divine. He went beyond the act of murder. And he dealt with what is in our hearts and what is in our minds. The people understood the commandment, thou shalt not kill. But anything short of murder was left untouched by what the Pharisees and the scribes had taught them. Jesus taught that if our heart has a murderous intent, that we are in danger of the judgment. If I have a desire for ill for someone and wish them misery or revenge, then I have what is within me that could wish for them death. That may sound extreme to you, but what Jesus is telling us is that we need to guard our minds and we need to guard our hearts and not allow them to develop thoughts of ill towards someone that could eventually become an action. The scribes condemned only the illegal act. Jesus brought the matter to our hearts and told us that we need to look at ourselves. 
we need to look at one who we may be in a dispute with. He told us that to brood over a disagreement and to keep within you, in your heart, and let it fester and let it develop. Refusing to forgive, refusing to seek peace, to seek revenge is an act against God. Sounds harsh, sounds hard. But that's what it is because we are told to love one another, to care for one another. Jesus went further. He said, if you say to your brother Raka, you shall be in contempt of the council. Raka is a harsh word. The best that we can do to translate that is to say it's someone who is empty-headed, a fool, maybe a nitwit. It's an insult to their intelligence. But it is almost unable to be translated because in that language it spoke to the hate that went with that word when someone was called that. It was spoken harshly. It was spoken without thinking, with indifference. It showed the hate that was spoken of when this word was used. Today we live in a society that speaks first and thinks later. They say things without thinking, without understanding the harm and the harshness that takes place. Jesus took it seriously. He said, if you're going to come to the altar and leave your gift on the altar and you remember that you have a dispute with a brother or a sister, don't leave your gift there. Put it down. Go and settle that dispute. And then once you've settled it, come back and leave your gift on the altar. I would say to us that it's a matter of examining our hearts before we accept the sacrament of Holy Communion that we examine our hearts, we look inside, and we see how are we standing before God when I take these elements? How are we dealing with God? If we're not dealing with our brothers and sisters, God is not pleased. What Jesus is saying to us here is it's more important to be at peace with our brothers and sisters to be loving and caring for them than it is to just observe a ritual that God requires. Now that's important because God requires that we observe the sacraments that our Lord asks us to observe. But the ill that we do to one another is not undone by keeping the rest of the law. The things that we shouldn't do, the things that we shouldn't say are not erased by coming to church on Sunday or by giving a tithe or by taking communion. We're still responsible to one another. We're still responsible to God. We need to understand that what we do to honor God is important, but how we treat one another is as well. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. An important word. You see, this isn't based on whether or not the one that we've had a disagreement with does anything to help rectify the situation. It's a talk and a concern to us that we are responsible. Whether we've made an effort to reconcile, we can't be responsible for what our brothers and sisters that we may have disagreed with do. But we are completely responsible for what we do. And the Lord says, have a clear conscience when you come and stand before me. Let your heart be clear. Rectify the things in your life that need to be taken care of and then come and stand before a holy God. Jesus teaches next, if you have a disagreement with a brother, 
settle it quickly. Why would he say that? Before the sin of hate or revenge or anger sets into your minds and imprisons that grudge in your heart. Jesus uses the example of a prison. He tells us that if we don't get this settled, it can imprison our lives. It can fester. It can grow. It can keep us in an attitude that makes us unhappy, unwilling to forgive, hard to deal with. It stays in our hearts when it should be put aside. Imprisoned is a figure of speech, but it tells us that it will put us in a prison of hate, a prison of revenge, a prison of anger. And if we don't let go of it, and if we don't deal with it, it can dominate our lives, even to the point of eternal punishment. Jesus said, don't let that happen in your life. Don't let that rule you. Next, Jesus speaks of adultery. He says, you have heard it said of those of old. In other words, the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is what the scribes taught, but it only applied to the act of adultery itself. Jesus takes it farther. He says that if we allow this lust to thrive in our minds, we're committing a sin in our hearts. Lust is an unsatisfiable hunger for power, pressure, prestige, or sex. It has nothing to do with the gift that God gave a married couple. It is instead about domination of one. It is self-centered, it is insensitive, and it doesn't recognize the needs of others. To commit the act of adultery is a greater sin than to commit it in your heart. But Jesus teaches that both are an act of sin against God. He taught to allow our mind to rest on this is a sin. It will lead us deeper into the sin. Having said that to yourself, don't allow yourself to believe the false notion. Well, I've thought it and I'm guilty, so I might as well give in to it. That's the devil working in your heart. That's the devil leading us into temptation further. The false notion that that is okay comes from Satan himself. Understand that adultery begins in your head, not in the bed. What the Lord is saying here is that you may not be able to control a passing thought. Temptation comes to each of us. Temptation is not a sin. The Lord was tempted. But understand, you can control what lives in your mind. Keep that thought passing. Don't allow it to pull up a chair and make itself comfortable. Pray for help. God will answer every prayer that you ask. He will not allow you to fail. How serious was Jesus about this? Jesus said it's better that if your eye causes you to sin, poke it out, rather than to allow it to lead you into a lifestyle that could cause your soul to be doomed. It would be better to go through life dismembered than to allow your hand to cause you to perish. In Jesus' day, there was a place called Gihana. It referred to a rubbish heap on the southwest side of Jerusalem. It was where criminals and indigents and those who had no family were taken when they died to be burned. It was a dump as well. That pile of rubbish was continually burning, continually smoking, continually stinking. In that day, it became a symbol for hell. We don't think of hell very often in this day. 
It's an unpleasant thought. We've neglected it so much that people tend to believe that hell is just a myth. Let me tell you, it's real. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. He wanted us to understand that it is real. Many people understand that they need to do better, but many don't care enough to do it. The salvation of our souls is more important than anything else that we will do in this world. Jesus gave us the harsh example that it would be better to go through life without a hand or an eye than it would be to go through hell for all eternity. How serious do we take that? Jesus taught us that we should guard our minds and our hearts and not have things taken away from us that God has put in there to dwell on. His goodness, His grace. Falling is easy, it can happen. God never intended for that for you. He intended better. It's a tough sermon. Not a lot of people preach on it this day, but it's in the Word of God. And He intended that each and every one of us hear and understand this and know it in our hearts. Next, Jesus spoke of divorce. He spoke of the law that said if a man divorces his wife, he must give her a certificate of divorce. Spurgeon said Moses insisted on writing this divorcement so that angry passions could have time to cool and that the separation, if it had to occur, would be performed with deliberation and little legal formality. This was referring to the law in Deuteronomy 24.1. And in Jesus' day, it had become an instrument of cruelty against wives. The scribes wanted this bill done because it met the law and it also padded their pockets. It was good for them. But it did little or nothing to preserve a marriage. The rabbis in that day argued about what was an acceptable cause of divorce that this Deuteronomy passage talked about. Two major rabbis in that day, the school of Shema said it referred to a sexual misdemeanor only authenticated by witnesses, while the school of Hillel said that any complaint was sufficient, even burning dinner would be grounds for a divorce. How silly it had become. Jesus said the law of divorce was a man-made desire. God views marriage as a commitment that was made before him. Only sexual immorality is grounds for a divorce, and even that can be forgiven both by God and by the spouse. And we live in a country where nearly one out of every two marriages ends in divorce. If these pews were filled today, there would be less people going through a divorce in this world. We have turned from the way of God. I've spoken to you today about different matters, difficult matters, holding grudges against those who have bothered you. Matters of lust, controlling your thoughts, living in the complete law of God and not looking for the easy way around it, yielding to His will instead of our desires. And if you want to know how many people have problems with that, it's a great deal of people. But I close to you with the most important thing that I'm going to say today. You are loved completely by forgiving God. It is not His will that any should perish or any should be lost. 
He is open to forgive you and restore you, to clean you as if nothing had ever happened in your life, and to hold you in his arms as precious. He is willing and wanting to do that for each of us today. Whether we're talking about things amongst the number of lists I've called out today or other things, God wants to forgive you. His grace is greater than any sin. He is ready and willing to deal with anything you bring to him this day and calling to you to find the peace that he gives. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you knowing, Lord, that we are human, we fall short. Too often we get too close to this world and not close enough to you. Forgive us when we do that, Lord. Bring your Holy Spirit into our hearts with a wave of power and peace that only comes from you. Draw us closer to you. Let us look to your will and your way and not to the world. For this world will end and eternity will come and it will be with you or without you. It will be wonderful or it will be horrible. And we, Lord, need to understand that. Take away guilt, Lord, as only you can. Replace it with love and peace. Replace it, Lord, that you know that they understand your love. They understand what you have for them. And you want it for all eternity. This we ask in your holy name. Amen.